Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Shield Classroom. In today's episode of Shield Classroom, we'll be talking about the Kerberos authentication protocol. We'll be primarily talking about how this protocol actually works. But before we get started, a quick introduction. My name is Ram and I'm a cybersecurity specialist at Manage Engine. Well, yes, take a look at this. This is how basically the Kerberos authentication protocol works. So we'll just get started here. Now take a look at this. First of all, a quick question. Why is it called Kerberos? Well, it comes from ancient Greek traditions where Kerberos was a three-headed dog. And guess what do we have here? We have three parties. We have the client or the user. That's party number one. And then we have the KDC or the key distribution center. That's the second. And then we have a service, right? So that's why this is called Kerberos. And the way this protocol actually works is the user or the client is going to first send a message over to the KDC. Now the KDC itself is going to be made up of two parts. It's going to be made up of two servers. One is called the authentication server and the second is called the ticket granting server. Now the authentication server, now abbreviated as AS, well, it's got the job of checking if the user is legit. And it's going to issue something called the ticket granting ticket. The ticket granting server is going to check if the service that is being requested is legit. And it's going to grant something called the service ticket. So those are the roles being performed by the authentication server and the ticket granting server. Now, the way this works is, well, number one, the user is going to send a message over to the KDC to, to the authentication server to be exact. And then the authentication server is going to reply to the user with something. A message of its own. That's number two. Then the user is going to take that message, it's going to do something with that message, make sense of that message, and then send another message, that's number three, back to the KDC. Now in this instance, it's going to send it actually to the TGS or the ticket granting server. The ticket granting server is then going to reply to the user, that's number four here. The user is going to make sense of that, and it's going to send another message, this time to the service, that's number five. And finally, the service is going to send a message back to the user. That's number six. And once this message is sent to the user, the user is going to do something at its end and make sure that everything is working okay. So basically, that's how the Kerberos authentication protocol works. Now we'll go into the details. We'll go into each of these steps one by one. So first up, we have the user sending a message to the authentication server, right? That's number one here. And what is this message going to contain? Well, it's going to contain the username and the service that is being requested, the name of the service. Primarily, these are the two things that it contains. It could contain a few other things as well, but these are the two important uh, things that are going to be contained in that message. And this message that the user creates and sends to the AS or the authentication server is not going to be encrypted. It's going to be in plain text. So that's the first part. Now, once the authentication server receives this message, well, it's going to have a database, right? I did make a point that the role of the authentication server is to check if the user is legit or not, right? And how is it going to do that? Well, it's got a database of its own where it's got a list of all the user IDs, the legitimate user IDs, and something called the client secret key. Every client will have a secret key and the authentication server is going to have in its database the list of all the client secret keys. So it's going to look for this username in its database and the authentication server is going to grab the client secret key. We have just abbreviated that as KC over here. Once the uh, authentication server grabs the client uh, secret key, it's going to create two messages of its own. Well, take a look at this. This is the first message it creates. Uh, this first message is going to contain the TGS name, so the name of the TGS. And it's also going to contain a randomly generated TGS session key. This is a short-lived key that gets generated at this stage by the authentication server. Well, so the TGS session key is also generated. Now, this entire message, that is the TGS name and the TGS session key, they will be encrypted by KC, that is the client secret key that it just grabbed over here. 
So it's going to be encrypted by that. That's message number one. The second message is nothing but the TGT, right? So I said that the authentication server, it also has the role of issuing the TGT. So it's going to create that TGT first. And what is going to be contained in the TGT? It's going to contain the TGS name, the same thing as this actually. It's also going to contain the TGS session key. It's also going to contain the user ID. So the only uh, extra thing that the TGT really contains over here is the user ID. But the way it's encrypted is going to be different. It's not going to be encrypted by the client secret key. Well, that's message one. Instead, it's going to be the second message is going to be encrypted by KS or the server's secret key. Well, it's got a it's got access to its own secret key, right? So that's what KS is. So the authentication server is going to encrypt it by KS. So that's done. These are the two messages that the authentication server creates at this point. Once that is done, the authentication server is going to send these two messages. This message and this message, the authentication server is going to send these two messages to the user back. That's number two right here. Now, once the user gets these two messages, well, it's going to be easy for the user to decrypt one, right? Because it's been encrypted by the client secret key, that's KC, and the user obviously has access to its own secret key, right? So it's going to be easy for the user to decrypt message one, and it's going to get exactly what's contained in that message. That is the TGS name and the TGS session key. So the user is going to get both of these, right? So the user gets that. Obviously, uh, the user is not going to be uh, able to decrypt uh, the, uh, the ticket granting ticket at this point of time because it's been encrypted by KS and the user obviously does not have access to KS. So this is still going to be uh, encrypted, but the user is certainly going to be able to decrypt the first message. Now the user is going to create two new messages. Message one is the service ID and it's not going to be encrypted. It's going to be in plain text. Message two is something called the user authenticator. Now the user authenticator does not really comprise of anything extravagant. It is just the user ID. It's the user's own user ID, except it's going to be encrypted by the TGS session key. Now, how did uh, the TGS session key come about over here? How is, it, how is the user able to encrypt this user ID with the TGS session key? Well, first step, right? The user just decrypted this message and it got a hold of the TGS session key right here. So now, when it creates two new messages, one of them being the user ID, it's going to encrypt this with the TGS session key that it just uh, got. So these are the two new messages that the user creates at this point of time. So yes, we are at this stage where the user has created two new messages, the service ID, which is not going to be encrypted. It's all in plain text. And the second message that the user creates is the user authentication, which is nothing but the user ID encrypted by something. And in this case, it has been encrypted by the TGS session key. Once these two messages have been created by the user, the user is kind of ready now. It's ready to actually send three messages to the TGS. And these are the three messages. We are at point three. So we are talking about this communication that happens here between the user sending three messages over to the TGS. That's what we're talking about right here. So what are these three messages? Well, it's going to be the service ID in plain text. It's going to be this message. That's what we have here. And then we have the user authenticator, uh, which is encrypted by the TGS session key. That's this message. And of course, the third message is going to be nothing but the encrypted TGT that we have over here. So that's the TGT and it contains all of these different things here. So that is what is going to be sent to the TGS by the user. So that's the third message. Now, all these three messages are going to be sent to the TGS. And once these messages reach the TGS, the first thing the TGS is going to do uh, is it's going to check if the service ID that's been sent to it you remember this message right here, message number one, that the service ID? Well, it's going to check if the service ID is in its own database. Remember the point that I made over here? One of the roles of the TGS is to check if the service is actually legitimate. And if it is legitimate, it also has the role of issuing a service ticket. 
So that's what it's going to do first. It's going to check if the service ID actually exists in its database. So it's going to look for this service ID. And if it finds a corresponding sec service secret key, it's going to grab that. So that's what we have here. The TGS is going to grab the service secret key. Once that is done, the TGS is also going to decrypt the TGT that was sent to it. Remember, it, uh, it's been sent the encrypted TGT, right? So it's got that now. It's going to decrypt it with its own um, key over here. So this is the server's own key and obviously it's got access to its own key. So it is going to use KS and it's going to decrypt the TGT. And in doing so, it's going to get all the information con um, contained therein. So it's going to get the TGS name, the user ID and the TGS session key, which is nothing but what we have here. That's what it's going to get over there. So it's going to get that and then the TGS is also going to decrypt the user authenticator, right? So this message over here, it's also going to be decrypted with the TGS session key that it just got right here. So just in the previous step right here, the TGS gets the TGS session key and it's going to use the TGS session key to decrypt the user authenticator. And once it does that, it's going to get the user ID. It's going to get this user ID right here. And then a check is going to happen. The TGS is going to check if the user ID in the user authenticator that it gets at this stage is actually the same as the user ID in the TGT. If the two are the same, then everything is working out fine and we can be going on to the next step. So that's what this check is all about. And so this is all that happens in this communication here. That's point number three between uh, the user and the TGS. Uh, now, what's going to happen is the TGS is going to create a few messages of its own. It's going to, in fact, create two messages. The first is it's going to create this message, which contains the service ID and a randomly generated short-lived service session key. It's going to encrypt this message by the TGS session key that it got right here. So. The TGS gets the TGS session key here. It's going to use this key to encrypt this message right here. The second message that the TGS creates is nothing but the service ticket, right? So that's the next role, right? This role that we talked about of the TGS, that's what it's going to create here. And this service ticket is going to comprise of three things. It's going to have the service ID, the user ID, and the same service session key, which is a short-lived key randomly generated, so it's going to have that there. And all of this is going to be encrypted by the service secret key. So that is what is happening here with the service ticket. It's going to be encrypted by the service secret key. Obviously, where did we get the service secret key from? Well, right here, we just, the TGS has grabbed the service secret key by looking at its own database. And, you know, uh, the service ID has been looked at, the corresponding service secret key has been grabbed. That's what is going to be used to encrypt the service ticket. All of this is done. We are on to point number four here. It's now time for the TGS to communicate with the user, right? So that's what we've got over here. The TGS is now going to send two messages, right? These two messages to the user. So uh, the service ID along with the service session key, which is encrypted by the TGS session key, and the service ticket itself, the encrypted service ticket, well, both of those are going to be sent to the user. It's going to be very easy for the user to decrypt the first message because the user has already got the TGS session key right here in the previous step. So it's going to use that and it's going to uh, decrypt this message and it's going to get the service ID. So the user is going to get the service ID. The user is also going to get the service session key by decrypting that. So the user gets all of this. Now the user is going to create a new message. In fact, it's going to be an authenticator message. And in an authenticator message, we necessarily will have to have the user ID. It's going to be encrypted by something. And in this case, it's going to be encrypted by the service session key, right? That the user just got. So 
the user ID is going to be encrypted by the service session key. Now the user is going to send this uh, user authenticator message along with the encrypted service ticket, which is nothing but this, to the service. That's point number five. So we are here right now. So that is what is happening. So user is going to send uh, this message along with the encrypted service ticket to the service. Now service, once it receives these two messages, well, it's very easy for the service to decrypt the service ticket because it's been encrypted by the service secret key. Obviously, the service will have access to its own secret key. So the service is going to decrypt the service ticket and it's going to get the service ID, the user ID and the service session key. Right, the service session key that's been contained within the service ticket, well, the service is now going to get a hold of that. Now the service is going to decrypt the user authenticator message, the message that it received over here, encrypted by the service session key, but it's going to decrypt that using the service session key that it just acquired. So having done that, the service is now also going to get the user ID. Now it's time for the service to ask a question. Is the user ID in the authenticator message the same as the user ID in the service ticket? Are they both the same? If they are the same, everything is working out good and we can actually be proceeding in the, in the next process. So that is what is happening with number five. Now the service is gonna create a service authenticator. The service authenticator, again, very much like a user authenticator, is going to be the service ID encrypted by something. In this case, the service ID is going to be encrypted by the service session key. So the service session key that the service got over here, the same service session key is going to be used by the service to encrypt the service ID. And once that is done, it's time for the service to communicate to the user. So we're talking about this step, step number six, that's where we are right here. So now the service is going to send the service authenticator to the user. And once the user gets a hold of this service authenticator, it's going to decrypt the service authenticator by using the service session key. So, you know, we, we saw that the user already has a hold of the service session key. Yes, right here. So the user already got a hold of the service session key in this step here. And so that is what is going to be used to get this, uh, to decrypt the message. And the user is going to get, a, get the service ID. Now the user is going to check if the service ID is actually correct. If, if in case it is actually the service that was being requested. That is what the user is going to do at this point of time. And with that, the, the authentication is completed. Basically, this is how the Kerberos authentication protocol works. It's much more secure than outdated authentication protocols like NTLM or LAN manager. But at the same time, it does have a few loopholes. Attackers can in fact bypass the Kerberos authentication protocol in an attack called Kerberosting, which is kind of an involved attack, but it can be accomplished. It can be done by attackers. And we'll be looking at Kerberosting in a whole lot more detail in a subsequent video. So we'll be covering Kerber Roasting in a, in a later video. Um, today we just saw what the Kerberos authentication protocol is all about, how a user gets authenticated using this protocol. So yeah, that's what I wanted to cover today. Um, until next time, please take care. Thank you so much.